Good morning, hey. everybody. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. We're excited that you're here today. Um, let everybody get in. It'll be hard to see for just a second because we're already sharing the screen, but I see some faces. Thank you for just using your first name again. That's wonderful. Um, um, let's see. Yeah, they're coming in. Excellent. Well, we are so excited to have you here. We're actually going to start in one minute. So those of you that are watching on YouTube, we will be with you in just one minute. We have an exciting guest today. We have some great science, a cool camping skill, um, some delicious cooking over the campfire, another story. And we also have a very um, exciting STEM challenge for you today. So welcome. Well, Susan, you're here. So make sure you mute your mics, campers, and then we'll ask you to turn them on when we want to talk or, or have you talk to us. And welcome to day two of the National Parks Virtual Camp. We are excited to be here. And Susan, I think that if we just go over the schedule real quickly, just so they sort of know what's coming. I wouldn't uh, take too much stock in the times because we don't usually adhere to those very well, but we're gonna have our opening um, a ranger talk with a great ranger. Um, okay. Camp science. Hi. <laughs> so let me, hello, let's make sure we got everybody muted there. Um, and then we're going to have an engineering challenge. Now, Susan, I noticed that yesterday we had some people add stuff to their campsites. And I would love to see what they've done. How about if we go to Stacia and Aaliyah's tents first? They're staying in two different tents, but I saw some wonderful pictures from yesterday. I'm working on it. I will get there. Let's go, go see Aaliyah's first. Remember guys, you're going to go to, to the campground and click on your tent. And mine is downloading. Here we go. We're going to visit Aaliyah's page. And I would love it, Aaliyah, if you're brave this morning, you want to unmute and tell us what you're doing in these pictures. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. So me and my sister were holding the thing I made yesterday. <laughs> and the sticks and then and then I'm holding my kebab. And did you eat your kebab all the way? Did you eat it? I think she, she went mute again. Yeah, I think she did. And so her sister, Stacia, is here also. And I, I noticed, Stacia, I'm going to make this picture a little bit bigger so we can see it a little bit better because, oh my goodness, check it out. Look at how much fruit Stacia put on her kebab. Isn't that awesome? So, wow. Stacia, did you enjoy that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Awesome. I'm really glad that you guys put pictures in. I'm going to go back home. And I think, Stacia, that the other folks that have pictures for us are Brinley and Cody. So, Brinley, you want to unmute and you tell us a little bit about your pictures and what you guys put in here? Um, so the first one was me shining the light on our constellations, and then I had me holding my, uh, I forgot what it's called. Um, the lasting project from yesterday? Yeah, lasting project, and then last one is my fruit kebab that was humongous uh, humongous i love that you put a strawberry on, strawberry in the very top very nice and do you want to tell us about cody's too yeah so the first one was i can't tell what that one was oh yeah when cody was making his constellation and then when uh, we were making the kebabs. Yeah. That's awesome. half finished though. Awesome. And I love that you guys put a tent up in your living room to make it feel like you really are camping. 
That's awesome. All right, Daisha, I think that's all the pictures that we have to share today, but I would sure love to see some, some other ones tomorrow. I, I totally agree. Susan, I'm, I'm actually going to drive now, if you don't mind. I'm Perfect, going to, yeah. You want to unshare? Let me, let me take care of that. thrilled to introduce you today to Mammoth Cave. Um, it, and it's Mammoth Cave, not caves, which is um, something I had to learn because I was putting an S on it. So let's go ahead and start our day of camp. So welcome everyone to Mammoth Cave. Let me show you about three minutes introduction and then I will introduce to you our special ranger for today. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Drizzle and welcome to the National Parks Expedition Challenge. Today we're in Mammoth Cave. Uh, our, our audio is cutting out. Okay, I'm, then I'm going to stop just that for a moment. A little less than a mile inside the cave. Give me just a minute. I just lost underground. That is pretty exciting. So for just a moment, um, we'll, we'll make sure today when you go back to your email that we, there's a lot of background knowledge, uh, background I th yeah, I think it's you, Susan. Okay. Um, so I'm going to introduce to you Jennifer Shackelford. Jennifer, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Jennifer is the ranger that I met at Mammoth Cave about a month and a half ago. Now, Jennifer had been helping me earlier um, with the National Parks Expedition Challenge, but we finally got to meet her. So Jennifer, welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Every, everyone to wait. Very cool. So Jennifer, tell us, how did you get to Mammoth Cave? What was your journey there? Well, when I was in fourth grade, are any of you all in fourth grade? Um, I came to Mammoth Cave on a field trip and I fell in love with it. I thought it was beautiful. And I knew that I wanted to become a park ranger. So I went to college and along the way, I changed my mind a little at times and thought, well, I really like being a teacher too. Maybe I would want to be a teacher. So I ended up teaching school for nine years. And then in the summertime, I would come work at Mammoth Cave sometimes. And eventually I decided that I thought Mammoth Cave was, was where I wanted to be all the time because I still get to teach students just like I'm teaching you all right now. Um, but I also get to be here at a beautiful national park. So, but my journey began on a field trip in fourth grade. That's exciting to hear because we know that our students, our campers love the national parks and they're probably thinking, how can they get there? So yes. why don't you tell us a little bit about Mammoth Cave, maybe the history of Mammoth Cave. Okay, and I have some pictures to share if that's okay. Is wonderful you can definitely share your screen okay i'm going to share my screen and i'm just going to tell you all a lot about mammoth cave so here we go okay so um are we seeing a picture of a sinkhole valley right now do you all see lots of green stuff and trees yes wonderful okay so this is an aerial view of the mammoth cave national park area and I think these look kind of like divots on a golf ball, but those are actually called sinkholes. And sinkholes are like a funnel into the cave system. They're kind of like your well, kitchen I sink. Can't see it very well. And it lets water go down underground and start forming a cave. And we have been a national park since 1941. And the reason that we are a national park is because we have the world's longest cave now. Um, we have over 412 miles of passageway 
and there's even more that's just unexplored. But we initially became a national park and we weren't the longest then, um, but because we have really cool history. And so you're gonna see some of those pictures in a few minutes that tell about the history. But the reason we have a big old cave in the middle of Kentucky is because of an ocean. Now there's not an ocean in Kentucky anymore, but a long time ago, millions of years ago during the Mississippian time period, there was a warm, shallow sea that covered this area and it left behind layer upon layer of a sedimentary, or you can say sedimentary, either one is fine, type of rock called limestone. And we have hundreds and hundreds of feet of limestone and it's made mostly of crushed up seashells from that ocean that was here a long time ago. And the ocean went away because tectonic plates under the earth, they shifted and moved around. And um, after that happened, a big river came down through here millions of years ago. And it left behind just a little bit of a type of rock we called sandstone. And sandstone is another sedimentary rock, but it's composed of sand. So we've got all of this limestone and then a little bit of sandstone, and that's our cap rock. And that sandstone is really important. It's why Mammoth Cave is the world's longest cave, because it acts like an umbrella over the top of us, or a roof over our house, or since you all are camping this week, like a tent. It protects the limestone underneath and keeps it from weathering and eroding away. And that's actually what caused Mammoth Cave, weathering and erosion. So weathering is just a fancy way of saying that the rocks start to break down and erosion is when that moves on. So I want everybody right now, and I can see some of your all's faces. I can see Krista and Brinley over here on my screen. I want you all to exhale, blow out a whole bunch of air. Everybody, oh, I see Aaliyah, did you exhale? Awesome. So when you do that, you're blowing out carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide mixes with water and it makes a weak acid called carbonic acid. And carbonic acid is the main ingredient in a soda. So if you've ever drank any type of soda pop, you have had some carbonic acid. Um, it can give you cavities in your teeth, but it can also give you a big, cool, giant cave. Because remember, that cave is made out of limestone rock. You know, it's, it's carved into the limestone, which is made of those crushed up seashells. And seashells are made out of a whole bunch of calcium, just like our teeth. So that is how the cave got here. Water came down and it ran down and it found cracks and crevices to get down into that solid limestone rock from a long time ago. And it weathered and eroded away a big giant cave. But I told you guys the reason we actually became a national park a long time ago, because remember in 1941, they didn't know Mammoth Cave was 400 miles long. Even when you all were little babies, Mammoth Cave wasn't 400 miles long. Um, nine, 10 years ago, we were still in the 300s. But this is why we became a national park. We have some amazing things here that are thousands of years old. This picture is of a slipper that belonged to a person that was in the area over 2000 years ago. We call those people paleo Indians. And they lived here um, in the area. They would go down inside Mammoth Cave. We don't know a lot about them because they were here so long ago, but we do know that they would take grasses from outside down by the Green River and they would weave that grass and make these little slippers that they would wear on their feet. And sometimes they left these behind. They also left um, things like pieces of gourds that they would use um, to carry water in, we believe, or other things into the cave. And they've done fancy carbon dating on those things. And that's how we know that they're a few thousand years old. Now, this is a picture that I just think is beautiful. This is a mineral called gypsum. And gypsum, um, it's, it's really um, soft. It, someday you'll learn about the Mohs scale of minerals. And um, you could take your fingernail and break this off. It's so soft. But gypsum, um, 
grows down in the cave. It kind of emerges that mineral from out of the limestone rock. And you'll only see this in really dry parts of Mammoth Cave um, where we have that sandstone up on top to keep a lot of water out. And this is another really interesting part of our history at Mammoth Cave. So this is from um, a saltpeter mining um, that occurred in the early 1800s. So in the early 1800s, before they started giving tours of the cave, um, there was a war called the War of 1812. And during that war, um, Great Britain, they kind of decided, hey, we want the United States back. And they wouldn't let us um, get gunpowder from the British West Indies. They blockaded our ports. And so we had to learn how to make our own gunpowder here in the United States. And so the people who owned the cave built these boxes and they would take dirt and put it down inside the boxes, let water trickle over it. And they brought that water in through hollowed out trees. And you'll see some pictures of that in a few minutes. And it kind of worked like a coffee pot. The water would run down over the dirt and the dirt has a lot of nitrogen in it. And eventually they pump that uh, niter beer is what it was called back up to the surface and they would add some more stuff to it. And it was kind of a long process, but you would end up um, with the things you needed to make gunpowder. So during the war of 1812, a whole lot of the gunpowder um, was produced from dirt that came out of Mammoth Cave. So that's, that's kind of neat. Now, one thing about the history of Mammoth Cave and these boxes is that all of this work, most of it was actually done by enslaved people. Um, so the owners at the time, they, um, they had enslaved African-Americans and they made them come down in the cave and, and do this work. So that's a sad part of our history. Um, after the War of 1812 was over, around 1815, that is when we started first having cave tours at Mammoth Cave National Park. And those enslaved people, they were the first guides. And I like to think that when they were down in the cave, um, maybe they had a sense of empowerment because they were in charge. If they wanted to blow out that candle, they could while they were leading all of those people around the cave. And Stephen Bishop, if any of you all love to read, he is such an interesting person to read about. He was one of the very first guides at Mammoth Cave and he actually um, discovered miles and miles of passageway. And there's some really cool books about Stephen Bishop. So remember that name and um, find a good book to read about Stephen. Now, this is a picture that shows what some of the people used to dress like over a hundred years ago. And they would wear dresses into the cave. The gentlemen would wear three piece suits and hats. And the first tours began here 204 years ago in 1816. And there's no end in sight. We don't know how long the cave is. We just know it's 412 plus who knows what miles. And this is a ranger down inside the cave and um, he's doing some mapping. He's trying to see how much longer the cave is. This is a picture of a really big room in the cave. Um, I could fit my house down inside here if that was possible. It's so large. But I wanted to show you this picture because if you look at the bottom corner, you can see some of those hollowed out tree trunks. And those are tulip poplar trees, which is the state tree of Kentucky. And that's how they would bring the water into the cave from a little waterfall at the entrance. And that's how they would get the niter beer back up to the surface so they could um, work on that process of turning it into gunpowder. And even though when people think about Mammoth Cave, I think they always think about the cave, there's also all kinds of amazing things above ground. So there are miles and miles of hiking trails and there are equestrian trails. So if you have a horse or if you want to go to one of the stables around here and um, go on a horse ride through the park, you can. There's also two rivers. There's the Green River and the Nolin River. And you can go hiking and canoeing on the river. And those are just some of the pictures. So I wanted to share those with you all. And um, let's see if I can get back over here. Yeah, Jennifer, thank you so much. It is 
a very beautiful place. We were only able to be there for a few hours, but we had a great time. And campers, the video, the link you get today in your email has the link to our video. So you can actually see us inside of the cave. Um, Susan, I wanted you to pop back up for a moment because Jennifer, this, this is Susan. She is someone that I write with. Um, we brought her in the National Parks Expedition this year. Steve, bring me, Steve's bringing me something. So he's gonna be in the camera for just a moment. There we go. So she came in this year with us and she's helping to write the curriculum and the content. And she is my partner uh, in crime for this, all these camps that we're doing. So I just wanted to make sure that you guys um, saw each other. And I think you can see her on the screen. I'm gonna put it back to this. Yay. Yeah. Nice to meet you. You're, you're muted. Oh, you're muted, Susan. Try that. I have, again. I have a picture of a cave today, but this is not Mammoth Cave, guys. Yesterday I showed you a spot in New Mexico. That's where I am. This is also a national park in New Mexico. Anybody know what it is? <gasps> Mary, unmute and tell me what is it? Carl's Bad Caverns. Yeah, we have Carl's Bad Caverns here, and I thought that might be fun for us to compare Carl's Bad and um, and Mammoth. But I've always wanted to visit Mammoth, Jennifer. I hope that I get to meet you someday. We are hoping that too. I would love that. <laughs> um, I actually found a picture of the historic entrance, but when I try to put it behind me. Um, <laughs> it does kind of weird things to my face. So I'm not really sure. Um, I'm going to have to work on that for the future. Yeah, Do y'all see that? Anytime you put a picture up this green behind you and you don't have a real green screen up, you're going to disappear. Okay. So I need to find a picture of the cave that doesn't have lots of green in it then. <laughs> or either hang up some fabric behind you. So everybody, if you'll get into the picture for a moment and let's do a group photo with with Jennifer and I'll send it out to you today. So everyone smile, put a big smile. There you go. Oh, let's do it again. Cause Aaliyah just came in. Hang on, everybody smile again. Very good. Um, does anybody have a question for Jennifer? If you do, you can type it in the um, chat window or you can raise your hand using your little reaction button. Jennifer, yesterday we were at Yosemite National Park. So completely on the other side of the country. Wonderful. Yeah. So uh, Susan, Mammoth Cave is where I uh, hope for us to be next summer with some teachers. So. Fantastic. First you so, need to smile. <laughs> I have a question for Jennifer and I think the kids might be interested in this too. Yesterday we heard about bears in Yosemite. And, and that, that was a pretty uh, interesting conversation. I'm curious, outside or inside Mammoth Cave, are there any kinds of particular kinds of animals or creatures that these guys might need to know about? Sure. Um, as far as bears go, there haven't been any bears spotted in the park. Let me put my phone on mute. I'm sorry, I forgot to do that. Since the early 1900s, but we do have some really amazing animals here at Mammoth Cave. Um, we have eyeless fish. They do not have eyes at all. Um, their bodies have adapted over time. And so they have no pigment because the cave is naturally completely dark. Um, so they are almost see-through. Um, and then where there should be eyes, they don't have any. Um, it's, they're really pretty neat looking. Um, we also have crayfish, or maybe some people might call them crawdads. I'm not sure where everyone is from. Um, but those crayfish inside the cave, um, they're cave crayfish. So they have special adaptations. They're also um, a whitish color with no pigment where you can almost see through them. Um, we have a lot of insects in the cave, over a hundred different species, and many of them also do not have eyes at all. Um, they use other things such as little antenna to find their way around and their bodies just don't even grow eyes. There's a type of beetle called an eyeless beetle um, that sniffs its way around in the cave eating other things. So those are probably um, some of the coolest things. I think the cutest thing to me I think bats are quite adorable. Raffinesque, big-eared bats are my favorite kind of bat. But probably my favorite animal, um, mammal inside the cave is called a pack rat. 
And the pack rats, you'll find those right around the entrances and the exits of the cave. And they like to collect things that people drop. So if you've ever had somebody call you a pack rat because you like to save a lot of stuff maybe in your bedroom, um, these pack rats <laughs> will pick up things like scrunchies or ponytail holders that somebody has on their wrist, they'll fall off. And when you're walking past them in their nest area, that's called their midden, M-I-D-D-E-N, and you'll see all kinds of cool things that have been dropped. Um, probably some of the neatest things, I've noticed a pacifier that like a baby dropped. Um, one time I saw some money, it, I think it was a $5 bill. Um, and then probably the strangest thing that I've ever noticed in a pack rat's midden is a shoe. It was like a little tiny baby shoe that I guess the parent was packing the infant and the shoe fell off and the pack rat found it and there was a shoe. It was so crazy looking. How funny. Um, <laughs> yes. You know, it's, it's funny to hear about pack rat station because yesterday we talked about the pika and yeah. pika are my favorite little rodent because they're just so cute. So that's fun to know that there's one in Mammoth that I need to know about too. Yes, yes. I, rodents do not um, inspire me as much as <laughs> but I will take your word that the pack rat is a cute thing. Well, yeah, it's super cute. Really <laughs> being here today. You're welcome to, to hang with us or if you have to get to something else. Boys and girls, yes. uh, give her a good wave. Thank her very much. Let me, one more time, let me put it where we can see it everybody and just say thank you so thank much you. guys she wants you to come visit her so mammoth yes. is open so when it's safe for you to go out and do some things with your family please do mammoth k would be a great place to start yep i would love to see all of you all if you make it to mammoth cave just um have them give me a call i can come say hello if i'm in that day all right that sounds great thank you so much Thank well, you all. I have a meeting in just a little bit, so I'm going to head off of here, but it was nice meeting all of you all. Nice to meet you again, Jennifer. Now we'll talk soon, okay? Sounds good. Thank you. Bye, you all. Um, okay, I don't know what just happened to my screen. Do you guys see all the... Yeah. Huh. That's weird. All right, so we, we're going to do our camp skills now, so go ahead and get your stream and your, your twine and your sticks ready. So you should have, I'm gonna change views here. You should have this first. And then we are going to add to this. So you should have this guy and then two more sticks that you're gonna be able to use. So I'm going to go ahead and cut my twine. Looks like Susan went ahead of us a little bit. I love that. She went from yesterday not knowing how to do this to today being a rock star. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get my third stick here. And remember, um, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can try a clove hitch or you can go ahead and just tie one knot around both sticks and just pull it tight. And then you can start lashing or wrapping the twine. So I've got mine down here and I have pulled my knot pretty tight so it wouldn't move. And now I'm gonna start lashing. So I saw something yesterday that some people lash the same way that they make a craft called the God's eye, which means they go around each stick every time. So instead of doing it on the sides first and then going to the top, they just keep the string or the twine going around every one of the sticks at the same time. Now, I'm trying that today because I want to see if it still holds as tight and voila, it does. And then I've tied a knot. So now I have these two top um, sticks ready or the side sticks and now I'm going to add the bottom stick. So I only have one left.
but I'm gonna have to cut twine twice. So you keep working. Ladesha, if I was out in the woods camping, what would I want to use lashing for? So you can tie up your uh, a trash bag up to a branch so that when you throw away your trash, a bear doesn't get it. You can uh, tie up some shelter. So if you have a tarp that you want to put from tree to tree, so that if it rains, the rain doesn't fall directly on you, you can lash. You can also make your own furniture. Um, and you can build a raft. So what we're doing today is called a frame, but it can lead into, if it were larger, into a raft where you could um, actually get from one place to another on a, a small lake or pond. We don't want you going across an ocean with it or anything like that. You can also float food that is uh, packed up pretty tightly that you want to keep cool. And uh, people would do that. They would put it on a little raft that they had lashed together. We have also made games out of this. So instead of cornhole, bringing a cornhole set with us or a horseshoe, set you can take your sticks that you find don't pull any off of a a tree we don't want to take something that's already on a tree we want to find some things that are dead but you could create a little basketball goal you could create a soccer goal you could create some really if you're going to stay in the camper for a long time or in the tent and you want to put some artwork around you could find some really cool leaves that have fallen and you could press them together, maybe put them under your picnic table to get them really flat. And then you could build a little frame and frame some work that you could put up. I um, had no idea that you could do so many different things with lashing. Right, and you know, you could also build your own plates if you wanted to, or trays. There's just a lot of things you can do and remember, we're not using hammers and nails, but if you were in our tiny house camp last week, this would have been day three of joining. So we're joining something together. Now, someone um, that I saw camping one time was lashing, but they were using willows to lash with. So they had sticks, but she was not using twine. She was using long willows or long pieces of grass to lash her things together. And she was able to make bowls out of hers. Oh, wow. So she used small sticks sort of for the, the wood part of it, if you will. And then she put the sticks sort of into an oval. And then she would lash around each one of them with the grass and build these really great bowls that you could hold fruit in, or you could carry to the, to the bathroom, the camp bathrooms, and have your soap and your washcloth in it. Now, oh, almost an alternative to a basket then. Yes. So I know we're all going to be at different places, but when you get to a good spot and you want to hold up what you've done, I'm going to put this back in scallops. So I have four places, and if I pull on these, they are pretty sturdy. Now, I've used a type of plastic tubing for this one. Yesterday, I used this large PVC pipe and then also some wooden dowels. But let's see what you have so far, if you want to show us yet. So I don't have a lot of big trees right near my house, so I wasn't able to go out and find the great sticks that some of you found. But I see some of you are using wooden dowels. Um, some of you are using craft sticks. Now, I could take some type of material or cardboard and put in the middle of this and make a little tray or a plate if I needed to. But tomorrow, we're gonna use this 
and a few more sticks and the the plastic from a trash bag so a trash bag was on your camping supply list doesn't have to be a large one but here will be the hardest part tomorrow i need you to try to find some longer sticks if you can't if you have something like this this plastic tubing or if you just want to watch us tomorrow we're going to try to make something that we can sit in or sit on which i think is going to be exciting so <laughs> this is the last so let me one more time let me see your your product here just hold it up in front of your in front of your, oh nice friendly all right i see that michael mary yeah oh i see yours Sarah and Gerard, I see, very nice. Nice job, Krista. Leah, good job. I'm not seeing it. Oh, Thomas, I see you're still working on one. So this, uh, Stacia, good job. So this is what we'll continue to work on tomorrow because we don't want to make something and just throw it away each day. We want to continue using and reusing this. Remember, this is something you can take a picture of and add to your campground. Well, I don't know about you, but again, working on this, traveling through a cave this morning all the way in Kentucky, it's got my stomach growling just a little bit. So who's <laughs> ready for some cooking lessons? Yay. Well, but I'm going to turn it over to Susan so she can start letting you pull in your um, supplies. Take it away, Chef Susan. Well, don't we have a poll to ask them first, though? Because I need to get some information. I want to know if you guys have a favorite kind of fruit filling that you were thinking about, because we're going to make some camp pies today. So Daisha just put up a poll. We want to know, do you like apple, cherry, raspberry, grape, strawberry, or blueberry? What's your favorite one? And I should have put other, but I didn't. So if there's nothing up there that excites you, you can type the word other, or you can type a, a different kind in the chat window. Interesting. All right. Strawberry right. in the lead so far. Do we have anybody else that needs to answer? Anybody else want to, to play? Okay. I'm going to end the poll because All we right. had a few people that said they weren't sure and that somebody put peach oh and i thought forgot about peach peach oh, yeah favorite so i'm going to end the poll and share the results so you guys can see zero percent apple oh 56 percent strawberry wow interesting yeah. right this popular so, one is strawberry yeah that's very interesting so Daisha and I were actually talking about this before we started because she said she never would have thought to put raspberry. And I said, well, what other kind of fruit is there for a pie? So it just completely depends on what your preference is. All right, I would like to share my screen so that we can take a look at the recipe real quick. And then I'm gonna switch cameras so that you can see what I'm going to do. Daisha, I don't know how to get rid of the poll. Can you get rid of it for me? Uh I did. I ended it. It's it's stuck up on my screen for some reason. Move it to the side. It's not showing on your share screen. Hmm. We're not seeing it. There we go. All right. So our recipe today is to make camp pies. And I don't know about you guys, but I've always liked pies. Pies have a fruit filling usually. Um, and then they will have a crust of some kind. Now, when you're out camping, you don't have an oven, and so you can't actually uh, cook it in an oven. And so instead of having pie crust, we are going to use bread for the crust. So your ingredients today will be bread, and then any flavor of jam or jelly, or you could even use a fruit, fruit pie filling if you wanted to. And then I like to add a little bit of cinnamon sugar mixture. And so we're going to take a look through here. This is going to be something that you're going to want to have warm or heated up. And so please make sure that you're getting parents permission or help 
uh, to do these pies. And I can't build a campfire in my house, Stacia. So I have an alternative that I'm gonna show you so that I can heat my, my, my pie up today. Now we're okay. using everything today that's already cooked. So you don't really have to heat it up if you don't want to. But if you want to, I'll show you some alternatives for how you can do that inside if you're in the same situation that I am where I don't have um, a, I don't have a campfire to cook mine on. So here you can see I've got my bread and I'm gonna go ahead and take out two pieces of bread so that I've got a top to my pie and a bottom to my pie. And I'll put those on my, my cutting board so that you can see them. And then I'm gonna be using my raspberry preserves. I also got a little tiny bit of butter because I'm gonna put that on the outside of my pie. That's an optional, you don't have to do that. So to do this, what I like to do is to kind of push my fingers down in the middle of my bread and just squish it a little bit, not a lot, but I wanna give it space so that my pie can have plenty of filling. And Michael, then- Michael has a question real quick, Michael. You know, you don't have to use your finger. You can just use a spoon and put a little pressure in the middle. Oh, that's a great idea. I kind of like using my finger, but yeah, you could do that too. Thank you. I might be on the phone right now. Absolutely. All right, so I'm going to put some of my raspberry preserves right in the middle like that. Make sure it's right in the middle. Leave some of the edges open. You don't want to have all of that um, jam all the way up to the, the very side. When you put the top on, You could leave the, the crust on the bread if you want to, or you can have a cookie cutter. Like I got my circle cookie cutter out and you're gonna put it on and press it down and that will close the edges of your pie off. So all of that yummy uh, jelly or preserves doesn't come squirting out. I don't know if you've ever had that happen. So here I've got my little pie now, th this is the part where if you want to warm it up, well, it might be hard if you don't have a campfire. I have something that's called a snackster, and you guys might have one of these too, a little panini press or a sandwich press. And so I'm going to cook my pie inside that. If you were camping, you could use something that is called a pie iron, and you can actually put it into the campfire, which is pretty cool. I'm going to add just a tiny, tiny bit of butter on, on the, the sides of mine. And then when I put it in and I close this down, it's gonna toast it. And oh, you can hear it kind of sizzling because I've had that, um, that snacks are heating up for a while. And after a couple minutes, then I can very carefully pull it out. Make sure you let it cool for a few minutes because it will be really warm and you don't wanna burn your lips, but then you will have a delicious, delicious pie to nibble on as we learn about some science with Daisha. So I'm gonna let mine cook for just a minute. You can finish putting yours together. And Daisha, I had another idea this morning that I totally forgot about. Oh, what? My mom used to do these for me, but she would put one other thing in with them. She added peanut butter. So I had a warm, toasty peanut butter and jelly pie, and they're really yummy too. So if you like peanut butter or almond butter, you could try doing that too. And Susan, you also suggested that you don't have to warm it up. Like if you just wanted, nope. I made mine into a little tree because um, I only used one piece of bread because I'm trying not to eat too much bread, but right. it was really delicious. So if I didn't want to go find a way to heat it, I could just eat this right now, couldn't I? Absolutely. And the other thing that I forgot to show you is the cinnamon sugar that was on our list of supplies. If you wanted to put a little sprinkler of cinnamon, cinnamon sugar on, you could. I use this kind because it already has the grinder in it and all I have to do is just kind of go like this and it grinds the cinnamon sugar right on top. Um, so that works too, if you wanted to add that. So there's lots of different ways that you can kind of um, move this around and do it differently so that it tastes the way you want it to taste. But there you go, an easy way to make a campfire pie. And again, we don't want you doing anything to heat anything up without having somebody there, okay? Yeah, Mary, I thought, I don't have an air fryer, but I thought about that because at fairs, they are constantly deep frying everything. <laughs> so an air fryer might be good. Absolutely. All right. Oh, I just pulled mine out of my little toaster. You can kind of see how toasty it got. 
So as soon as it cools down a little bit, I'll take a bite of it. But Daisha, I think we're probably ready to move on and do some science, unless we want to give these guys a, a minute to, to finish up with what they're doing. Well, we'll let them finish, but I'll go ahead and start. I was really pleased to hear Jennifer talk about um, how a cave uh, becomes a cave. She talked about weathering and erosion. So I'm going to ask that if you um, collected any rocks while you were out yesterday, that was one of the, the suggestions, if you could get a few rocks, that you go ahead and, and maybe pull one or two of those out so you can just sort of look at all the crevices and all the dents and the different colors that you see in your rock. There's a lot of different shapes. There's divots. When she was showing us the picture of the um, mammoth cave, she, we saw some sinkholes or divots. Well, these rocks have the same type of markings on them that that land did. So she also talked about the types of rocks that form the caves where she is, is someone has taken over my computer. So I know that there's a hack to do that. So try not to do that guys with little, okay, thanks. <laughs> I can't hear you. Michael, is it you? Okay. So um, just be careful and make sure you're not trying to do that. And I think it's because we have some smart people here. But I have this rock. And if you can see, there are some divots in there and also some scratches that look a little bit fossil-y, right? So our science for today is to look to see how caves are formed. So we know that some rocks dissolve more quickly than others. And we're going to do an experiment that shows us that. So if you're going to do it with me today on your list of materials, I said that you needed a little bit of clay. And I'm going to pull a little piece out. Mine happens to be tan. And we needed a sugar cube. So I was able to, well, my husband was able to find us some sugar cubes. So I have this. And then I have this clay. So I am going to fold or squish this clay into a strip. Not very big. And then I am going to wrap the strip around my sugar cube. I'm only going to wrap it on the side. Give me a thumbs up, guys, campers, if you can see that I have not um, messed up the top or the bottom. You can still see the sugar. Okay. I am going to now put this into my bowl and I'm going to put it over on the side. So if you have your journal or a piece of paper and a pencil and you want to sketch with me, you can. I am going to be dropping some water into this bowl. And I just didn't mean to put any there. Hang on. There we go. And you can see the sugar cube from the top and the bottom. I'm going to lay it here and I'm going to drop some water into that. I am going to, as soon as I, there it is. I'm gonna use this little, little dropper here, but if you don't have an eye dropper or a medicine dropper, you can use a straw. I want us to make some predictions about which of these rocks, my clay rock or my sugar rock is going to dissolve more quickly. And Susan, maybe we can have them put those in the chat window. And I'm actually going to unshare my screen so you can see this a little better. Let me go back to, all right. So you should be able to see me, make sure you've got your microphones muted and that will help. 
I don't know why it's coming up to another person. Susan, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see? Okay, here we go. All right, so I'm going to do 20 drops. So look at it now, and then let's make a prediction on what is going to happen after these 20 drops. And they're typing in the chat box what their predictions are, right? Yes. All right, so what do you think is going to happen, guys? Which of these rocks is going to dissolve more quickly? I Actually, Susan, if you want to let them unmute, I, I see hands up, but... Brinley, did you want to say something? Or Sarah or Jared? Okay, what? Say? It's going to melt into pieces. Oh, you think it's going to melt into pieces? Which one? The clay? No. Sugar. Yeah. I think the clay the, or the sugar. I think the, the sugar clay. cube. I think the sugar cube is going to melt into pieces. I, yeah. I, All right, so. I'm going to pull it up and I want you to see, can you see that? The sugar cube is getting smaller because it was sticking out and now it's not sticking out as much. So I'm gonna put 20 more drops. Brinley, what do you wanna say? The, the sugar cube the sugar cube would dissolve into uh, a liquid, a sugary liquid. And then after a while of the clay sitting in the sugary water, the clay would start to uh, soak the sugar water in and it would make a, con uh, it would make a slippery, wetter consistency. Sounds like you've got a little, little bit of background knowledge. You're exactly right. And if, if I hold it up now, what are you noticing about the sugar cube? Hold it towards the camera so we can see, Daisha. We can't really see. There we go. Oh my goodness, you guys, check it out. There's a Where's hole. The sugar cube. There's a hole. Now someone has typed in the um, chat window, can you use regular sugar? The only reason I'm not using regular sugar is that's going to be granular and I needed something that was in a so I don't think we're going to get to 100 drops. So I'm going to do the last 20, which is going to make 60. Oh. And so Brindley, you were correct. The sugar has dissolved, basically, but is also emerged into the walls of the rocks and if you can see there are there is water now in the bottom of here that is brown the same color as this so i agree that if i keep putting water on this pretty soon all of these rocks are going to be dissolved but definitely the sugar rock is going to dissolve quicker now i have jelly all over my hands <laughs> And I have sugar and clay. So if my tech support can bring me um, a paper towel, that would be great because I can't even see, I can't even work my mouse right now. So, so here was our predictions. And we all said that the sugar would go more or would be dissolved easier. And that is why, oh, thanks, I got, I got something from my tech person, yay. That is how the caves are um, created over years and years and years and years of time. I'm going to ask or show you a poll and see if you can answer this one. And here we go, this is poll number three. Have you ever been inside of a cave? Yes. So if you can click on that yes or no. So far, we're pretty even there, Susan. About half and half. Oh, the yeses are more now. 
Fantastic. So it looks like 67%, oh, 60% of you have been in a cave. How many of you of those no's would like to be in a cave? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see a lot of people that are sort of doing that. So I want to give you one more piece of information. We know that there are, actually, I'm not going to tell you the answer. I want to see if you come up with it. We know that there are two formations inside of a cave that are very spectacular. In fact, if you look at um, Susan's, behind Susan, you're going to see both of these formations. One is called a stalactite and one is called a stalagmite. And when they form, they, one comes from the ceiling and one comes from the ground. And I want you to figure out which one it is. But when they meet together, that is called a column. So let's give you a second to research. What is a stalactite? And what is a stalagmite? Which one comes from the ceiling down and which one goes from the ground up? And let's see if we have any, any answers there. In fact, we'll let you keep adding to the chat window um, while we head to our campfire story time in just a moment. I'm even going to ask my tech support, which is my husband, if he wants to add to the chat window because he remembers a little uh, poem or a little song that helps him remember stalactites and stalagmites. So maybe he will add that to our chat window for us. Susan, I'm sweating because I have jelly and sugar and clay everywhere all over me. And we're out in basically a cave right now <laughs> and it is hot. So I'm ready for a story. Exactly, uh, or Susan's corner. As my <laughs> right, that's what they, we decided yesterday. I, I do want to say, Krista just said in in uh, the chat that she's she discovered stalagmites are on the floor and stalactites are coming from the ceiling. She is absolutely right. Good job, good research there, kiddo. Proud of you. So yesterday I shared a book with you about where the national parks started. It was a book about two people, Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir and how they met and went camping and John Muir taught Teddy Roosevelt about this amazing world we have. That is a historical book. This book is called Our Great Big Backyard. This is not a historical book. This is a book that was written just a few years ago. And the author of this book used to be a first lady. Her name is Laura Bush. And she and her daughter wrote this book together. And um, you know, it's interesting because when we, when we hear about national parks, people will say, well, that's my park. And they really are. They belong to the American people. And so this book is written about that. And I love that they started the book with the end pages here showing you a map of the United States. And I love what my green screen does. Can you guys tell any of the states that were green are now see-through? Isn't that funny? And there is a list over here on the picture that says parks to visit. Everglades, Big Bend, Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, and Yosemite. So this is their to-do list. Do you guys keep to-do lists? I have one that I, I call my bucket list of places that I want to go. Mammoth Cave is, is one of them. So Our Great Big Backyard by Laura Bush and Jenna Bush. Huddle, my BFF Hank said. I have our whole glorious summer mapped out. Hank wanted to watch a different movie every day. Ricky was going to create a YouTube channel, and Louise and I couldn't wait to have an epic starship tournament. It was going to be the best summer of our lives, but that was before. That night, Mom gave me the bad news. We're going to spend the whole summer on a road trip. Dad's map was different from Hank's. But I was supposed to spend it with my friends. Jane, there's more to life than staring at a screen. You'll love being on the open road. As if I didn't have enough to worry about. My pets, my pest of a brother, Sam, kept bothering me. Come on, Jane, let's go outside. We'll practice camping. No way, I'm too busy. 
On the last day of school, my parents picked me up for what they called the Great American Road Trip. I sent a message, a message to my friends. As we drove south, my parents sang along the show tunes. How humiliating. At least I had their phone to keep me company. Jane, put that away. You're missing some beautiful sights. All I'm missing are my friends. First stop, Everglades National Park. Swamps, cypress trees, creepy hanging moss, and mosquitoes as far as the eye could see. Big deal. There's absolutely nothing to see here. But if you look close in that picture, you'll see that there's a lot to see in the Everglades. There are birds that are pink, flamingos, and spoonbills. They have manatees. They have alligators. I think that would be really cool to go see. Deisha, have you ever been to the Everglades? We have. We've done a national parks from there. We drove forever to get to our next stop. As we crossed the Mississippi River, Sam waved to the riverboat captain. I hid behind my iPad. Next stop, Big Bend National Park. I couldn't wait to get out of the car so I could finally play Starship. Jane, please put that away. Come look through the telescope. Oh, wow. Now this is similar to what we talked about yesterday with the, with the dark sky. Many of our national parks have dark skies and you can see amazing things up in the sky because it is so dark and there's not all the lights from our buildings and cities. The sky in Texas was huge and bright. Then bless my lucky stars, a meteor shower lit up the sky like fireworks, brighter than any screen I had ever seen. We traveled west across the desert. Sam and I pretended we were astronauts on Mars. Next stop, Grand Canyon National Park. We tiptoed over the skywalk like acrobats on a tightrope. The river so far below looked like a shiny ribbon. Now I know Daisha has been to the Grand Canyon National Park. She went not too long ago. Yes. As we explored, I sent a selfie to my crew. Yep, that's me on Blaze, my mule. The only thing missing is you. Hugs and kisses. When we rafted down the Colorado River, I was a pirate captain with Sam as my first mate, navigating tre treacherous waters. Next stop, Yellowstone National Park. We were park rangers on the lookout for animals. Mountain lions, buffalo, and bears, oh my. And actually on this page is one of my favorite animals down here in the river, right down here. Oops. You look closely. A moose, yeah. I got to see one this summer and it was so cool. We waited and we waited for Old Faithful to explode into the air and then finally, five, four, three, two, one, blast off. Last stop, Yosemite National Park. Sam and I served our last dinner on the road. Fireflies hung in the air like fluttering stars and we pretended we were cowboys. The mountain went up and up and up, straight into the sky, watching over us. I felt really small, but really great, too, like I was part of something big. And if you look, they're sitting around the campfire, and they're singing campfire songs and looking at those tall mountains in Yosemite, which you saw yesterday in the pictures and videos that we showed you. The next morning, I couldn't find my most prized possession, my tablet. Jane, you packed it away a week ago, Mom said. How can I tell my friends we're coming home? Wait, I got it. She's writing letters to them. What did you like best, I asked Sam. The campfires? I thought about all the stars. I'm going to miss our big adventure. I was sad when we got home, but then I took Baxter into our backyard and I had a brilliant idea. Mom, can my friends come over for a camp out? I told Hank and Ricky and Louise about all the places we'd seen. I had the best summer after all. It's spectacular out there. Just then, a shooting star zoomed across the sky. Look, it's beautiful right here in our own backyard. And then one of the things that I like best about this book is the last two pages are a list of all the different national parks that you could go visit with your family. And then 
more of that really cool end pages down here. But she checked off all those cool places that she got to see. So I'm hoping that maybe tonight when it gets dark that you'll go outside and see if maybe you can see some of those shooting stars or some of those constellations and maybe find some some joy in the nature right around you since we can't get out on the road and travel right now maybe just step outside your front door i bet you could find cool things there too susan i love that story yeah. I, I have been to three of those so we still need to go to big bend and yosemite yeah. yep well and i've never been to grand canyon Oh, yeah, I live so close to it. Brinley, maybe we need to do a family trip to the Grand Canyon. That'd be cool, right? <laughs> well, thank you, Susan, for a great story. Absolutely. I'm going to share my screen now and take you into our last piece for today, and that is our STEM challenge. So we know that Mammoth Cave is an American national park in Kentucky. Um, it is the longest cave system known in the world. So it's just a little over 400 miles. And that's just what they have discovered. There are still places in the cave that they haven't gone to yet. There is a ranger there that his only job is to stay every day in parts of the cave and use a little brush to dig away carefully to find fossils. And he is the dude that found the shark fossil there, which proves that the sea was there. But we have a problem. There are chemicals, poisons, if you will, that are being tossed into on the ground, which are getting into the ground water. And it's very dangerous. It could be something like mom or dad are outside with their car and they're changing the oil. And then they pour the oil, the rest of it on the ground and it seeps into our groundwater. We know that the water cycle is evaporation, condensation, precipitation, and either runoff, which goes down into the water systems, or seepage, which goes into the ground. I want <clears throat> you guys to see if you can design a water filter that someone can put their chemicals in and they can safely get rid of or a water filter so that when they get water out of the, the, the lakes or the ponds, they can pour it through a filter and get the water clean again. Now, there are several uh, videos online that you can look at on YouTube to create your own water filter. You're going to be doing it for fresh water to get salt out of salt water takes a little bit more energy and you have to use a little bit of electricity to do that. So let's brainstorm for just a moment. What materials would you need to build your own water filter? I'm going to unshare my screen for a moment and see if anybody wants to share. What materials could you use to build a water filter? Uh, Brindley? You could probably um, have it to where um, there would be kind of like, uh, so it would be a tubing system with, um, with kind of like a fire to burn all the uh, materials off and right. then it would go in fresh with another set of tubing systems. I love that. That's a great idea. Anybody else have some ideas or some materials that you might could use to build a water filter? Remember, you want to get the water that you get that's dirty <laughs> and you want to turn it into clean water. So you want it to go in here clean. What would you have to put, Michael? Um, what I would do is I would make a boiling system to where there's like three different tubes so you can have three cups of, uh, three cup or bottles of water 
pour it down, they all go into one system and boil all the water into clean. And then they go through a filter system and then you have fresh water. I like that. Mary, what are you thinking? You could use coffee filters. You could use coffee filters. It's thick enough where all the nasty stuff could stay on top, but the water, the clean water could go through. One of my favorite movies, because I have a grandson that we watch it all the time, is Finding Nemo. And remember in the fish tank that he's in at the dentist office, they have a filter system. They tried to uh, block it with a rock so the water would get dirty again. They had a filter system and they use something called charcoal to keep it. Riley? I was gonna say charcoal. Very good. Now you wanna use what we call activated charcoal and not charcoal that you would use on your grill. That has some different qualities to it. So you wanna be very careful that you use things that you get permission to use. So my friends, that is your challenge. This afternoon, I want you to see if you can design a little water filter. You could go outside and get a little bit of dirt and put it into a cup of water and that could be your dirty water. And then see if you can create a filter to pour it through. Now I'm gonna ask you not to use um, boiling water for this one. See if you can build it without the use of heat because we know that some of you are home by yourself and we don't want you using anything that's gonna require uh, electricity to turn on heat. But you're gonna do this and then Jennifer would love to see your designs because she would like to share it with the other rangers um don't forget that we would love for you to share your photos here we had a few people share today we would like a few more tomorrow tomorrow is our last day and our last day is going to be at the national mall so we're going to learn a little bit about the lincoln memorial the washington monument the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. We're also gonna talk um, a little bit about this big area of water called the Tidal Basin. And Susan, are we gonna learn anything about cherry blossoms tomorrow? You're muted, Susan. I keep forgetting that I'm muting myself. I'm sorry, guys. So, so yes, tomorrow I have a special book uh, to share with you that talks about the cherry trees that are in Washington, D.C. And we have a, a snack tomorrow that is, gosh, Jason, I think it might be one of one of the world's favorite camping snacks. Um, this is one that we all know and love. I bet you you guys can figure it out. It only has three ingredients. So I'll leave you with, with that. Three ingredients, they're listed up there, graham crackers, chocolate, and marshmallows. What do you think we're making? So tomorrow you're gonna need your lashing from today. <laughs> Need some more sticks and twine and I didn't put this on there but I'll put it in the email bring that trash bag that I asked you to pack in your um, book bag and then this is something that was not in your supply list but I would love for you to do it with me 